entertainment-driven retail, mall versus standalone. What is next? Well, retail spaces, as we know, are evolving, with entertainment and experiential elements leading the way. Well, join our panel of experts as they discuss the future of malls, destination retail, as it's known, and standalone formats. Discussing this, we have a wonderful panel and a moderator. Please welcome to the stage, as our final chair arrives, Ibrahim Abdiak, the CEO and co-founder of The Smash Room. Sharif el VP of Leisure and Entertainment at al Properties, Glitch. Engineer Faisal al the CEO of Al-Andalus Property. Scott Pride, Principal and Middle East Mixed Use Director of DLR Group. And guys, if you could try and sit roughly near your photographs, uh, the pictures above the uh, chairs. I know they're not all in line, but roughly around there would be wonderful if you could. Thank you. Uh, Mustafa Kanbala, the founder and CEO of Michipay. Jacques Reader, Reader sorry, Managing Director of Threads ME. Salim Sikathan, the President and Director of Retail of Royal Furniture. Tim Harrison-Jones, the general manager of my son's favorite resort here in Dubai, Legoland. Uh, he's joining us. And your moderator is Zeynep Sarsar, the associate director of retail, CBRE, Mina. And of course, here we go, guys, for your next session. Welcome to one and all. Your next panel is underway. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here with a remarkable gr group of industry experts who are ready to dive into the uh, exciting world of retail with me and what the future holds. From the latest tech trends to shifting uh, consumer behaviors, we are here to explore it all. So I'm going to start with Ibrahim. I know uh, being uh, the founder of an experience center, the Smash Room, you are uh, expanding the brand within the UAE market and also changing the concept to uh, different formats based on consumer behaviors and demands. Uh, so can you tell us how are the traditional retail spaces adapting to changing behavior um, demands to, uh, within the age of e-commerce and online shopping? Sure. Uh, first, uh, hi everyone. My name is Ibrahim Abudiak. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, well, uh, everything started back uh, when I got fired and divorced. All happened within a couple of months. Uh, met my business partner who lost her grandmother, and then we started the Smash Room uh, in 2018. So the Smash Room started as a standalone concept. Uh, we found a warehouse in Alcuz. Uh, we wanted we transformed that warehouse into a very genuine and authentic experience, uh, but it's a destination on its own. So people need to come uh, specifically for uh, that warehouse in Al-Quds, drive around. And we know today uh, the traffic in Dubai is getting um, busier and busier uh, by, by the day. Uh, so we've heard a lot of feedback from our customers that um, you know they wanted another location. They wanted us to be in a mall. Um, our initial view to the Smash Room being in a mall was no, it doesn't fit the brand, uh, you know, personality. It's not that fun, and we're going to be a lot restricted. I mean, Alcuz is is a pretty much a free space. You can blast the music really loud. There's nobody living around, right? But when you are in a mall, you have a lot of restrictions. However, with with the consumer behavior is, is also changing. And as we see here in Dubai, people really spend a lot of their time in malls. So it's not just shopping. It's, uh, it became an entertainment spot. And um, I've seen a lot of malls uh, having a lot of new entertainment concepts inside. So, um, and this led us to actually saying uh, yes, and today as we speak, uh, we are finalizing opening a new Smash Room uh, with a new concept within uh, the concept itself. So basically we're adding a twist to the Smash Room, we call it the Smash Room City. 
And this is, again, came based on feedback from customers. Who, so we're doing themed smashes. We're creating an office-like room. So you walk in, and there is an office environment. There is a desk. There is a, a laptop. There is a printer, um, a meeting table, and then you're, um, and a cooler, a water cooler. And then you're allowed to, to smash everything. So yes, this is uh, us responding to uh, the changes in the consumer behavior. We're opening. And in a few days, everybody is welcome. We're going to be at the sports society in Murdiv. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Uh, Jack, you've been uh, expanding the brand. Uh, it's a very successful concept. However, we've been talking, you are also adapting your brand, changing your format. Can you please share your uh, experience on this? Good afternoon, everybody. A tough act to follow. Um, we do also have a smash room, but that's the last or the three last days before the school opened, if you come to my stores, it's very similar to a smash room. Um, as I mentioned earlier, schoolwear is probably the most boring product that you would ever wish to come and buy. So for us, it was the challenge to make it, uh, to bring entertainment into our stores while uh, under pressure, you drag your child or your daughter to come and buy uh, schoolwear. So it was, in, it, it was important for us to get our product mix over and above just schoolware correct and try and enhance the shopping experience to more entertainment rather than just pure shopping. Apropos to a normal fashion retailer, I want the customer to spend a shorter period of time in my store, but I need to upsell, downsell, cross-sell, do all the... Uh, tricks that you need in the trade. So it was the product mix that we had to look at very carefully and make sure that besides the normal school where we have exciting products that we've added to, to our product range to enhance that period that they are in our store. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Jack. Uh, hi, Sheriff. I know Galich is doing quite well in Al Gurayr and I would like to talk about more on experience, but just before diving into that, uh, I want to talk about having diverse mix within shopping centers. All of us know that this is quite important uh, for the longevity of, of the project. So what are the benefits of maintaining a diverse mix within the malls, and how does it impact overall shopping experience of consumers? Thank you, Zainab. So being part of al Ghurair Properties and al Ghurair Group, al Ghurair has always been uh, pioneers. So al Ghurair Center, many might not know, it's the first mall in the UAE, right? So uh, it opened in the 1980s. So now by the end of 2021, it was the time, you know, demographics have changed. People have moved away from the center of the city to the other side. So there was a start of a strategy on how to uh, occupy the mall. At the time, the mall was sitting on 70% occupancy. So the strategic initiative started from two anchors. One is driving an entertainment anchor. The second was developing a food hall option. So at that time, we, uh, the group came up with an idea to have Glitch as an entertainment actor, uh, anchor and Flavor as a food hall. By the end of this year, the mall is reaching 98% occupancy, reaching the uh, highest footfall ever it has ever achieved. That's thanks to Glitch and Flavor driving footfalls every day. And that's the dream of every retailer. So what does every retailer want to come to a mall? They want footfalls. So today, al Ghurair being the heart of the old city, we're having this footfall. A lot of retailers have came back. We're sitting on 98% occupancy. So that answers the question. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Sulin. I know Royal Furniture has been operating standalone, but we see you guys also in the mall. Can you share your experience, the differences between you see outside being standalone and also being part of a diverse mix shopping centers? So we are talking about UAE, which has more than 80 to 90% expat population. So with having more than 200 nationalities from all over the world, this diverse now the cultures, the traditions, the celebrations, Everything is different. So when it comes to a mall, a lot of these people come to the mall to celebrate this, buy items for gifts for their uh, loved ones, family, friends. And this helps in driving footfall into the mall. And this clearly helps every brand that is there in any mall. This is very important, as I see in this country more than any country that I've traveled in. The culture differences brings a lot of footfall. And this is what actually helps each and every uh, tenant in a mall. And that is the difference that I'm seeing from standalone 
because when it's a standalone, a lot of customers come just for, okay, I'm from furniture background. So the entire home setup is the only reason why customers come to uh, uh, my store. But when it comes to a mall, people go for buying electronics, fashion, have uh, lunch, dinner. And on, on that basis, they'll just walk into my store to buy maybe one accessory, two accessories, maybe a bed, maybe a mattress. So that helps a lot when it comes to a mall. Thank you very much. Uh, we heard what retailers are thinking about this. Let's look into this from a different perspective. Faisal, being a very successful landlord and developer within Saudi market, how does having a diverse mix within your property help as a landlord to you? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be with this uh, the, uh, the panel. Uh, appreciated, and we hope we will provide a added value to our uh, guest. Uh, when you speak about tenant mix, there is two elements on that, so I don't want to make, take much, but, but today, with what's happened in the life, uh, the traffic, that time is very quick, uh, everything running fast, and everything taking a long time. So the visit to the malls now for the families, and even individuals, need to be utilized as much. So if it's a family members, family members, each of those family members is looking for special things to do. Uh, the female wife may be looking for something related to a retailer, the kids looking for entertainment, blah, 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 ongoing. Having the right tenant mix will make the destination is, uh, I would say, uh, attractive to all the uh, family members. And this is, is where we are all working to do as a landlord. So by having those uh, real estate, or I'll say those locations are attractive to everyone, everyone will be interested to come. So this is from an uh, angle. The other angle also today, that going to the malls is not anymore going for dedicated tasks. So you are not going to the mall to go to X retailer to get something and leave. What do you see today, the people, how they are changing, is people taking this as a, as a trip as a, either a family trip, either a, a colleague trip, either a, a friend's a trip, either whatever you name it, a trip. but it's a, it's a really a, a short vacation or short trip to enjoy the mall. So without having a proper tenant mix, you will not be satisfying their needs all in different people. The last thing to mention on that, that as you know, everyone is, if they go to the same location every time, they will keep born of it. So, it will be like old, and uh, renovation is important from physical things, but also tenant mix and the changes of tenant mix will keep the place attractive to everyone. So if I come every time to that small, and it's the same shops every place, so X, Y, Z, and I repeat it the same all around the years, so it will not be any more attractive to them. So tenant mix is playing a very, very, very important element in the malls, and I think it's getting a good big percentage of its own success or God for habit failure. Thank you very much. Uh, so we understand this is very important, but where does, does this start? If you develop and build your mall not uh, matching with the tailored standards, then you can't lease your space. Scott, this is where you guys step in. Uh, at DLR Group, uh, can you tell us how you design the malls, how you advise the developers when it comes to diverse mix and making sure that you'll have the right spaces for these retailers? Firstly, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to talk today. Um, you know, we as designers, you know, we've, the way we focus, of course, it's all about users, it's about people first. Everything we do is about people. So we start with, of course, a good brief, an understanding of what we're trying to do um, within the location of the site. And we make sure that the project is grounded uh, within its location by understanding the, the culture and the history, of course, all the, all the natural things that are needed for a really good project. In terms of um, a good scheme, we look at the planning. So obviously, uh, in terms of retail design, you know, the anchor positioning, uh, the way that people move between spaces within the planning is really, really important because that drives footfall um, from A to B. Um, you know, we call it sort of ABCs of retail in terms of how people connect and link between spaces. Of course, the number one uh, approach is to think about dwell times 
uh, really improve how people, uh, you know, use these uh, these spaces. Of course, through time, uh, you know, malls are now connected to much more 24-hour community spaces as well, in terms of lifestyle, um, uh, you know, spaces with connections to re residential and other uses, of course. So really the importance here is to um, understand the, the, the true ingredients of good planning, which links uh, you know, good, good tenants together and the, you know, the, the mixes between anchors that lead to some, some of the smaller, smaller retailers all comes together. So in summary, you, you end up having a very active project. You know, there are no dead ends. Dead ends, of course, is, 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 is a no-no. The idea really that you create active um, circulation with great uses and connections throughout. That is the, the key drivers. Um, and, you know, and a testament to that for some of our projects. We did work on Sports Society's one of our projects. It was good when Abraham says that he's in that project. It's good to hear. Uh, you know, everything is driven around a really strong narrative. That particular project was about sports. Um, other projects uh, such as, um, naming not a few, but APA at the point, which is uh, in, in construction currently, Again, these spaces are all about um, events areas and connections that lead to um, good planning and, and, and links to leisure and other anchors throughout. So it's a combination basically of really good planning and good, um, good metrics that lead to good design. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. When we talk about diverse mixes, we all understand that the anchors are one of the most and power that you need in your shopping center. Entertainment is being one of your major anchor clients uh, or tenants within the shopping centers. Uh, let's discuss this a little bit more. Sheriff, I know of, uh, you, are, you guys are anchoring um, the Al Grayer Center, and um, can you please tell us how are entertainment and leisure venues, uh, venues being utilized to drive footfall? and also increase the co consumer spending within the retail spaces. So, uh, so I'll talk about Glitch, which is a showcase, an actual uh, story that has happened. So UAE being a mall culture country, during summer and during the hot weather, people will always opt out to indoor entertainment. So Glitch is a 40,000 square feet uh, family inter ultimate family entertainment center, which combines adventures, arcades, VR, and bowling, right? So with these attractions, we are able to attract kids during summer. And moreover, the most part that can benefit the mall is are the focus on groups business. So when I say groups business, it's birthdays, it's school trips. So Birthdays is one of the things that parents always afraid of when it's approaching for their kids and they have a lot of hassles. Okay, what should I do? Where should I take my kids? What about the decoration? So what we try to do is treat birthdays as a wedding. We want to take that off the parents. Just tell us when is the birthday. Give us some time in advance and we'll plan the entire thing. Decorations, birthday celebration, how, how we can keep the kids actively engaged. And I emphasize on actively because today in today's world, all the kids are very attached to the digital screens. We have the adventurous part, which is the climbing walls, the zip lines, which keeps them actively engaged and moving around rather than being on their screens. So when I talk about birthdays, birthdays are a minimum 10 children with their families and relatives. They will come to the mall, they will celebrate the birthday, they will go through the mall, they will do shopping in the mall. So that will keep them engaged within the mall for at least four to five hours. On an overall scale, if I'll take in the last six months, we have driven more than 500 birthdays. Every birthday, minimum 15 kids with their families. We have driven maybe around uh, 1,000 students every month coming through the doors of Glitch. So that brings awareness to the mall, keeps the parents engaged in the mall. So that's how usually entertainment drive footfall to the mall. Thank you very much. So we've been talking about malls. However, there are concepts that extremely successful uh, being outside of the mall, but you also have your own habitat within the center where you have a connected hotel or when you have your retail offerings. Tim from Legoland, can you please uh, give us your thoughts? Yeah, we're, we're very lucky and thank you uh, for inviting me here today. Um, my primary job is to sell fun um, to our guests that come and, and visit us. Um, it, it's really important um, for, for guests and the kids that come to us to engage with Lego and have Le Lego build experiences. For us, if they have multiple experiences throughout the park, we know then actually in our shops, they're more likely to buy Lego products. 
It also helps having the number one toy brand in the world to sell. Um, we also find that our events, so Halloween, uh, National Day, Christmas, uh, Chinese New Year, so the event-led strategy, again, helps us to engage with kids to be aware and buy more Lego box sets. Um, we also find working very clo closely with Lego, the parent company, and the activations they have, and some of you will, have, will be new aware that they've just launched um, F1 um, partnership with Lego. So again, allowing us to really capitalize on that brand exposure uh, and bring that to life within our parks. Um, to, to be able to sell and give kids that experience. Thank you very much. Scott, I'll come back to you. So we are talking all of this, and this starts at design stage. What do you need to consider? What is the key element from the design stage that you will make sure that every consumer will be uh, roaming within the centers and not going only one shop and leaving the shopping centers? Um. I mean, the importance, as I mentioned before, is pl good planning obviously starts with understanding how people move uh, within such a project. So you have to understand access, of course, uh, you know, balanced uh, connections for parking, for drop-off areas, for, um, you know, how people generally have, th the success of a project really starts with good access um, and, uh, you know, and people will come back time and time again if they can visit a project very easily and they can leave very easily. I mean, there are good examples in Dubai with some, some bad examples, of course, and there's some good examples on how people want to park and then leave a center. So it really starts with that, I think. So good balanced uh, connections is number one, that's key. Uh, then you, you, know, you break down the, the spaces b between the hierarchy of, of uses. Obviously, you, your anchors tend to then bring some of the smaller tenants with them, so it's, it's sort of a, a, a natural progression of, of um, you know, the ingredients of a good retail plan uh, emerges. So I think the, the key these days is flexibility. I think that's number one. I think the idea that you have fixed and flexible program within design is, is very, very important because that means the project through the year will evolve. Uh, you know, people want, and communities want to see new things and new trends as part of the the ongoing uh, does dynamic of any of these spaces. Um, you know, I think if, if you go back some years where it was purely about a pure mall, um, these days, as, as I mentioned before, it's about um, linking, uh, you know, other uses together to create true community, um, you know, locations. And it is a very testament to that when you look at some, some examples, um, you know, the importance of, of how people uh, really connect during the day and the evening uh, to really capitalize these spaces. So in summary, I think the importance is, you know, very well subscribed um, access uh, in terms of uh, positioning within the planning, that's very, very, very important. And ultimately that would lead to a strong, uh, uh, you know, community uh, driver within uh, within the project. So it's it's a number of ingredients that will really drive uh, drive the project to success. And um, it's um, it's very exciting these days to see some of these projects coming forward. So um, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Scott. So we talked about the largest concepts. Let's talk about the smallest ones. What does kiosks and pop-ups do within the malls, and how they support business? Right, Jack. How, how are flexible retail formats, like pop-ups and kiosks, meeting the demand for short-term retail experiences, and how does this support your, your business? I think if we can draw an analogy between bricks and mortar and pop-up stores, if I can say, you can think of an aircraft carrier. It's a big ship, difficult to move slowly to reposition, and then you think of the little strike craft that can quickly, nimbly change their position and do things. That's the difference between the pop-up kiosks vis-a-vis -vis large brick and mortar. The benefits of the pop-up is simple. It's short-term, you save on rent. If you got a prefab set up, it's quick to set up, it's quick to maneuver. You can also be very selective in the areas that you pop it up. Secondly, if you want to launch a new product, brilliant space to do it. Uh, earlier on, I was listening on the Omni channel, the speaker said, what has sadly been lacking lately in, in retail is the 
personal contact your staff has with your customer. Pop-up stores gives you quintessentially that experience. It's a smaller retail environment. There's a one-on-one. -on -one. If you the big question is train your staff adequately so that they understand. You also then have a very selective product range in your pop-up store, which again is going to be the target market that you want to actually target in the area that you are. So it brings a little bit of the personal touch back to retail, which I think has, uh, and I'm not blaming Omni or e-commerce for that matter, but it's sadly lacking where that personal touch have gone wayward. So it has big financial benefits to it. It's been proven that the successful pop-up stores generates 20 to 30 percent better uh, returns on a turnover than bricks and mortar. Secondly, if you capitalize on the seasonal trends, as the one speaker said, the the Christmas, the, the you know retailers tend to personify an action on that in a smaller environment focus your product range, use the seasonal trends to your advantage and, and, and benefit uh, by that. In my concept, we use it slightly different. Uh, I mentioned earlier the three days of uh, smash room that I have uh, when, uh, you know, just before the school opens. We, we put pop-up stores in schools that where the parent has to go pay the school fees, they get an introductory to the new school if they uh, are new members. So that takes away the pressure from my stores if I have these pop-up stores in the, in the schools. A little bit different to the fashion side. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for that. Ibrahim, I know we need some space to smash things, but you are developing exciting formats. Uh, can you share with us? Uh, I don't think we have enough space to smash here, do we? Uh, well, what we can do is bring the Smash Mobile, which is uh, world's first mobile smash room. So uh, the Smash Room also have uh, created um, basically a Smash Room on wheels, um, a truck that is fully fitted to uh, enable people to smash at their doorstep. And this is another sort of like a wave of uh, services or entertainment that instead of you coming to a specific place to a mall no i'll come to you i'll set up uh, the stuff in your you know backyard or you know in front of your villa and have a private session in front of your house or in front of your office or you know at events and stuff like that so this is something that we've just created a few months ago um, in addition to that we also do a lot of pop-ups um, at events uh, so basically we set up rooms uh, that is temporary uh, during um, different events. Uh, we did it in schools also, we did it in some universities, uh, in big events around the country, just like Amoti and Mother of the Nation, Amoti B, um, with different themes as well. So there is always something new that people will look uh, forward to. Um, so these are some of the things that we do to make sure that also people can uh, see the smash and experience it at their um, wherever they hang out at the beach for example uh, last year we were at the at the beach uh, in uh, in the beach canteen uh, so yeah uh, we, we come to you that that's the trend right now thank you very much Faisal how does landlords mall operators benefit from having kiosks um, I will take it from a different angle, answering your question quickly from a different angle. If you go to landlords, as you know, malls and properties always having uh, big capex, so lands become very expensive, building become very expensive, construction, blah, 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 all of this expensive. So all of those will give you extra income to this property and which will help the landlord, if you take it from the area of landlord. If you take it from the area or, or I would say from the side of the customers was coming, most of those pop-ups, and especially when it's come to events, this will get you new, fresh customers, because they are coming for those. So this is, will be an extra customers also coming to uh, your property or your uh, malls or whatever uh, type. Uh, the third side also you look to it is for the regular customers. For regular customers, for every time, they will be having and new things, so they have a change. So I have today a pop-up for X, or I have a event here for Y, or, or, or. So this is will let our customer, who used customer to offer my property, will get them to see different things, and they will be keep attractive to this destination. And the fourth, for the retailer, most of those pop-ups, as mentioned, 
this is will give a direct contact between the retailer and the uh, clients. And this is uh, giving some personalized relation in, uh, in the selling uh, operation. So overall, the pop-ups, if it's managed in acceptable way, and always you need to manage, uh, you know, whatever related to the walking or, this, or in and out and those elements, uh, if it's managed in proper way, it's always add to whatever property they have on it. Thank you very much. So, um, Mustafa, sorry for keeping you waiting until now. Uh, let's talk about some experiential elements that are integrated into retail spaces and uh, how do they enhance uh, customer experience. With MishiPay, you offer um, easy payment solutions, but how, how does this enhance the experience? Thank you for that. And thank you, everyone, for, for coming, and thank you for having me. Yes, with Mishupe, the, the original idea that I started with nine years ago was to make sure to bring the best of the online checkout experience to the store so that a shopper can just scan the barcode of an item, pay for an item, and leave the store. Over time, of course, we've understood the different value of checkout experiences. But when I consider the shopper's journey through the store, you need to understand and bifurcate these, right? There's one shopper who knows what they want and then wants to come in, buy, and leave. And there's the other shopper who discovers inside the store. For both of these, the best moment inside the store is when they find out what they want to buy, right? From then to actually buying is where the experience most of the time, unfortunately, sucks, right? That's where you have almost like a great movie with a bad climax. It spoils the whole experience. Our first job for those who are discovering inside the store is helping them with that discovery. Right, getting them to that. And that's where we've seen some really great uses of in-store materials. You've seen you know, RFID in the trial rooms. You've seen screens around the store which show ads as well as item recommendations. And it's then about having more staff who can interact with the shoppers. Of course, if you can have a smash room, that's also good. But most stores don't have a space for that. But you know, the, the idea being that you get the customer through that journey from entering to the store to finding out what they want to buy and then saying, yes, I want to buy it, right? So we're doing that through empowering our staff with our new MPOS devices where they can see in real time, doesn't matter their training, they can already see what the shopper would like to buy through their own history or if they're a new shopper through others who have bought similar items. Then in the trial room with the RFID where, you know, once you've decided you've put it on and you like it, you don't need to wait anymore, right? And finally, through our new um, product, which is ads inside the store, empowered with kiosks as well as other screens, but it's a new element of understanding and discovery inside the store, right? Because as you have less and less space to display your items, you can use the screens inside the store. I think the best example probably is you know, Best Buy, who learned this and converted a $2 billion loss into a $2 billion profit by using their retail space as an advertising space for their suppliers. A lot more retailers in pharma, grocery, convenience, and even other department stores now have the opportunity to do this and can combine it with the data of the specific user, especially where they have a loyalty element. Thank you very much. Ibrahim, we've been talking about you come to us, we come to you, uh, all of this, but what kind of experiential elements you offer and uh, in, in the concepts new and existing? Yeah. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me talk specifically about the new uh, location that we are building today and will be ready in a couple of days. Uh, so it's called the Smash Room City and it offers a new kind of experience, sort of like Smash 2.0. Um, in a way that today when you go to Alku's location, to the origin location, it's, it's a generic room. You go in, you choose what you want to smash, and uh, more or less the experience, if you tried it, uh, there's less likely you want to try again unless there's something different. Uh, but today we're offering five different themed smash rooms within the smash room city. So you want to sort of like collect them. We're going to give you some sort of passport and you will collect each experience every time you try. So today you come in and you smash uh, a desk in an office. Tomorrow you go to a restaurant environment. How many of you wanted to flip a table in a restaurant or just take that 
glasses on the t or the cutlers and just throw them on the on the wall. And <laughs> now you can do all of that. Even if this if this was a fantasy, I mean, like it's something. Well, at the heart of this mushroom is self-expression and also uh, helping people express themselves in a safe environment. But today we're taking it to the next level. We're also adding that entertainment part because what we have seen is that 80% of our customers come down for fun. And the 20% come down because they're depressed, they, they got fired, they, uh, they broke up with their partner, ATC. Um, so, so with the new concept, all these five different experiences from a restaurant to a laundry room to a supermarket um, is something new, nobody has done it before. And it will be an attraction, so even for tourists. Uh, somebody who comes to Dubai and is like, this is the only place that I can experience around the world. So it is one of the bucket list, and, and we work with Dubai Tourism to actually highlight these things and uh, tell people more about them. Thank you very much. Faisal, we understand this is important for retailers, but it's also important for landlords to activate their spaces, to develop events throughout the year. How, how is your experience on this? How do you drag footfall with these kind of events and activations to the malls? Uh, it is very important. Uh, today, uh, people, you know, with the social media that you see everywhere and how people engage to the social media. Social media did advertise much the events, advertise much the national days, advertise much whatever the occasions that people are celebrating. So uh, it is one of the most important elements for advertising for the, whatever, either property, either land, either area, whatever if you want. So, and you can consider this across all of the events that's happening around the world. Uh, today we see this has become very important and even when you saw the new projects that's in, implemented across the world, you always find they are in design, so as I mentioned, they make a place for those events. They may prepare a place where they ha can handle more people and, 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 and today when you go even across, even not only the malls, you see the stadiums, uh, whatever, either in UK or in Europe or in US, those stadiums now are used more in events, more than being used for, let's say, football and others or other sports. So it is very important. It's, it's getting an, uh, not only income, it's getting a new people. The, uh, the location will be tagged in the customer heads as a, this is a place where always when I come, I will find an event, I will find blah, blah, blah. And it will be tied with the customer even if there is an event. Let's say today is Eid or whatever occasion. I'm going to X place because usually they do celebration there or do. But it has become very important and linking the property to uh, to the customer that this is a place where I will enjoy more than the usual enjoyment of shopping, entertainment, food and privilege. Thank you very much. Not like only experiential elements, but also your st store design is quite important to uh, cap capture that consumer engagement. Sulin, uh, what are the current trends in retail store and visual merchandising with the technology times? So nowadays, it's all about minimalist it's all about the plain whites, the simple, straight designs, which people like to see and just add modifications. For example, pop-up colors are used along with the whites to make sure that uh, uh, the theme of the place looks better. Um, to talk about technology, AI is getting used in a lot of use cases to understand uh, what products are moving, in which location of the store the product is moving, which item has to be pulled out, which item has to be kept inside. It, AI drives a lot of these insights to make sure that the customers get to see the product that they're looking for and also push items which are uh, high, uh, I would say, highly discounted so that customers can get it at a cheaper rate. Um, yeah, pretty much. Thank you very much. So what we did, we designed our mall, our project well. We've put the best mix ever, we did events and activations, we brought in footfall. It's very important to convert this footfall to spending. Well, how Mishipay help us to understand the, the, the relationship between the footfall and uh, spend? Yeah, so here I go back to you know, what I was saying, that the type of customer, it doesn't matter whether they know what they're buying, 
or whether they come in to discover. When they do discover, when they're ready to purchase, is when you need to close them. It's the analogy that I would give to my salespeople, that the moment the customer is ready to sign, that's when you need to shut up and just get them to sign, right? You don't continue to keep selling. The same way you don't waste the customer's time once they're ready to buy inside the store, you take them through the checkout as soon as you can. This is why you see you know, the Apple store with the uh, staff empowered, everyone with the Mpos, closing you, letting you buy the laptop, the watch, the phone right then and there, right? It's what we do with our self-checkout kiosk, our scan and go and our Mpos. And we've seen some of our best customers like Event Network with the Georgia Aquarium and aquariums and museums all around the US see more than an 8% improvement in the conversion rate, especially where your stores are in high traffic locations like malls or uh, you know, a really great experience center. The shoppers have other things to do, right? In a mall, I'm probably getting late for a movie, for a dinner with my friends or my wife. And the more time I take inside the store after I've decided what to buy, the more likely I am to not buy that item, right? So that's where we've seen this increase of 8% in the conversion rate by allowing the customer to check out the moment that they want to, um, you know, as soon as after that as possible. Thank you very much. Tim, lastly, may I have your thoughts on this subject? Yeah, we're using uh, a lot of data um, from the initial point of the events that we might be running from the marketing team, which types of guests are we bringing in? Um, is it education, school kids? If that's the case, then we need to look and speak with the commercial teams to say they're not going to be buying 1,000 dirham box sets, so we need to have more sort of pocket money areas. Um, to hotel guests that will be buying the more expensive, they're the most valuable guests to us. We'll also be looking at data to say, you know, uh, looking at our ride data, most of our rides will exit through a shop. So you'll have a chance to purchase through there. So what's the throughput of the ride? Are there queues of the people as a ride down? That also affect photography spends, et cetera. So we're constantly reviewing that sort of data. And then sort of finally for us, we, we will be looking at where we have our events placed around the, the, the business. What times are those events to where then people will shop and then eat? Um, so constantly reviewing that. And that can change if we then start to have significant events or significant new rides or products that the consumer's uh, habits change and they will then walk around the park in a different route. So for us, is, is that reviewing of data constantly to make sure that we're giving the best experience to the guest, but at the same time trying to be as most profitable as possible. Perfect. Thank you very much. So as we wrap up this uh, panel discussion today, I want to thank all my panelists for sharing their experiences and perspectives. Uh, we've explored various aspects of retail industry from consumer experience to merging trends. Let's stay connected, collaborate, and continue driving innovation into the retail sector. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks a lot. <laughs>